one thing we know for certain, the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor set in motion a course of events that would eventually lead us to a one world government. Japan began this war in treachery. We shall end it in victory. In the aftermath of World War II, the United Nations was created and the path toward a one world government accelerated. Each war brings us one step closer to what the Bible calls the end of the world. Checkpoints are being set up everywhere. The police state is tightening its grip on the people of the United States. And to those who understand biblical prophecy, what comes next will not be a surprise. At some time in the future, the King James Bible states that everyone on the planet will be required to take a mark in order to buy or sell. As our current economic system collapses and as technology expands, cash is becoming a thing of the past. The reality of a cashless society is not far off. In fact, it's already being implemented. Despite denial by many religious leaders, evil men are working around the clock to bring in a new world order. We can see the end rapidly approaching and the stage being set for the emergence of the Antichrist. We can hear the voices of those who are subverting our U.S. Constitution and promoting this global government system. A new world order. And with all this right around the corner, this film is more important than ever. Satan is working behind the scenes to set up a one world government and a one world religion in preparation for the Antichrist. He has also deceived modern evangelical Christians into believing that they will be removed from this earth before the Great Tribulation takes place. This doctrine, known as the Pre-Tribulation Rapture, teaches that Christ may return at any moment and that there will be no signs of His coming. As a result of this deception, most Christians are completely unprepared for what the Bible has warned us is coming. Although the scriptures clearly state in Matthew 24 and elsewhere that the rapture will take place after the tribulation, big name preachers, Bible colleges, and popular films such as Left Behind have taught the masses to expect that the rapture may occur at any moment. And because most Christians have never read the entire Bible for themselves, few are aware that the pre-trib rapture is a fraud not found in scripture. But if the pre-tribulation rapture... This is the 70th week of Daniel. I think most people agree the, the, the 70th week starts when a treaty is made. Antichrist makes a treaty. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27a, for first part of the verse. Apparently that treaty is to allow Israel to rebuild their temple. I think most people agree on that. There's going to be a treaty that lets the Jews rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. Now, this doesn't mean God wants it to be done. He's just telling this is what's going to happen. I think the temple is unnecessary, and the Jews have missed the Messiah. And God's not, I shouldn't say not interested, but he, he's not wishing they would make a temple. He doesn't need their temple to be worshipped. Then there's a seven-year period that most people agree, the 70th week, because it says in Daniel chapter 9, in the midst of the week, he breaks the treaty. So he makes a treaty, then he breaks the treaty in the middle of the week. That would be three and a half years. This is described as a time of great falling away. And this is described as a time of great tribulation, the last three and a half years. Then Jesus comes back. He returns on what's called the day of Christ, but he only comes to the clouds and calls the believers up. He doesn't touch down on the ground. There are two parts or two phases to his second coming. He comes down, calls up his believers. We're raptured up. It's called the day of Christ. And it's the day the sun and the moon go dark, which is mentioned 10 times in the Bible. The first one is Isaiah 13, 10. The last one is Revelation 6, 12. I used to teach, like you probably teach now, <clears throat> that John, Revelation chapter 4, when he says, come up hither to John, that that is somehow symbolic of the rapture. That's what I was taught. That's what I taught myself to others. No. The, he, he, told, he answered clearly, I'm coming when the sun and the moon go dark. Well, that happens in Revelation 6, 12. So we're here for the first half of chapter 6, the first four, first five seals. We're here to see that happen. He calls us up. We're at the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
while the wrath of God falls on the planet. About 1,040 days of God's wrath, about three years. And I'll tell you how I got that if you're interested in that number. But So he catches us up. Then he comes back down, what's called the second advent, this time all the way to the earth and touches down on the Mount of Olives, which splits in half and opens up a pathway to the, uh, uh, for, the water, for the sea to come into the Dead Sea. So this is called uh, his final return. He comes back on white horses and, start, and the Battle of Armageddon takes place. So there are two parts to the second coming separated by the time of wrath. All through the Bible, and there are hundreds of verses about it in my book and on here, I think I found them all, the wrath of God falls in the day of the Lord. And I strongly disagree with you, brother. The day of the Lord is indeed a day, a, a thousand years day. Now, the fact that people misuse that for other things does not prove this is wrong. <clears throat> there are scriptures about the day of kings in the day of David or in the day of King Solomon, which is obviously a time period. The, the rapture is never talked about as the day of the Lord. That's the day of Christ. And there are seven mentions of the day of Christ, which is a single day, the day of the rapture. Many New Bible perversions, and praise God, I'm very strongly with you on the King James issue, brother. But many New Bible perversions have changed the day of Christ in, in Thessalonians to be the day of the Lord because it messes up their theology. And I cover that in my book very thoroughly. So my position is Jesus comes back after the tribulation, before the wrath of God falls. God's children are not appointed unto wrath. But in John 16, he said, in the world ye shall have tribulation. We do see tribulation. We do not see wrath. They are not the same. And the day of Christ, the rapture, a single day, is not the same as the day of the Lord, which is a thousand-year period. The day of the Lord has two parts to it, a time of God's wrath, and then most of it, 997 years, is a time of great blessing when the wolf, wolf and the lamb lay down together. So this day of the Lord, I had to shorten up to go here, so I took out 231 feet of it. Uh, but this is the time of great blessing on earth, and the Christians rule and reign with Christ. When the temple is desolate, Daniel asked him in Daniel chapter 8, Lord, how long is the temple going to be desolate? And he said, 2,300 days. Well, three and a half years is 1,260 days. So the time of the temple desolation runs past the end of the tribulation time, and there's 1,040 days or approximately three years of God's wrath. And he said, if those days would not be shortened, there would be no flesh surviving. So it's shortened to down to 1,040 days. And then this, he comes back with us. I mean, while this is happening on earth, we're up in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So I think we'd have to have a long discussion about the day of the Lord, exactly what is that. I think there are many instances, and I cover them in my, in my book. Where it I'll talk to you about the uh, pre-tribulation rapture. Man, I used to believe in a pre-tribulation rapture years ago, and uh, I do believe in a rapture, what I call the resurrection of the saints. But there's only two resurrections. There's one resurrection of the saints and one resurrection of the damned. According to Revelation chapter 20, it says, Blessed are those who take part in the first resurrection, for on them the second death has no power over them, but they shall be priests and kings unto God and unto his Christ. So according to Revelation chapter 20, there's only two resurrections. There's one resurrection of the, of the children of God, and there's only one resurrection of the damned. And the rest of the dead, they don't come back to life again until the end of a thousand years. If you're not in the first resurrection, you're not even saved, okay? There's no Jesus coming back, resurrecting one group, and then, and then this other group that has to go through some dispensation to try to explain why Christians are being slaughtered in the last days. Because clearly in Revelation, Christians are being slaughtered in the last days. But we're all promised we're going to be taken out before them. Well, I'd like to get into this. Lord brother. Jesus in the air at the rapture of the church, when he takes us with him to heaven, while the tribulation period is occurring on the earth, at the second coming... No, I'm getting stressed out, man. I, I keep looking for it, but I can't find it anywhere. I guess you don't really care. I'm trying to look for it right now, man. Look for what? The pre-tribulation rapture. In the Quran. Of course in the Quran. Where else am I going to look? Definitely not in the Bible. No, you, there, there's one other place you can look. You got to get a good dispensational book, man. You're telling me this whole time the pre-tribulation rapture is in there and yeah, not in here? Of course. You ever hear about rightly dividing the word of truth? You know that verse? Uh-huh. The only way you can do that is through the dispensational system. So I'll read to you. 
um, chapter 86, the pre-tribulational rapture view. Pre-tribulationism teaches that the rapture of the church, both dead and living saints, will occur before the seven-year tribulation period, okay? That's pretty good, man. Um, supporters of this view, John Nelson Darby. Yo, I've been telling you, man. John Nelson Darby gave the greatest initial syst systematizing of pre-tribulationism. This is because he saw the church as a special work of God distinct from his program for Israel. Yo, that's the system, man. There's two distinct peoples, Israel and the church. Does it have if any Bible that, verses? The, the, the... Is there yo, any you're Bible not getting it, Matt. You're not, yo, you're not getting it. The Bible verses don't matter. Mm. You need to follow the system, and then you can make the Bible say anything. As long as you're using the system, you'll find the pre-tribulation rapture. you got to use the system. Man. I don't care about the dispensational system. I don't care about dispensationalism. Let me throw this out the window. Yo, yo, that's not mine, man. That's not mine. About a week ago, Larissa and I posted a video on our channel on why the pre-tribulation rapture is not taught in the Bible. Now, that video is 28 minutes long, and we understand, you know, people probably watch, what, five, six, seven minutes of it and then seven turn minutes, off? Seven minutes, probably Especially once they find out our position is against the pre-tribulation yeah, rapture. Yeah. It is a controversial topic, doctrine. Um, the reason why we're, we're recording this follow-up video is for clarity, so we can get right into the scriptures, because that video, it took us about, I think, seven minutes. Yeah. We had to... You know, come well, up with that introduction. It was kind of a lose-lose because we needed to, you know, lay that down. We needed to say, you know, don't watch us with, you know, dispensational presuppositions. Um, but in saying that, a lot of people will just turn it off after hearing that. And then if we don't say that and we just get right into it, then people will be like, well, you know, Israel is distinct from the church. And, you know, they're, they're, they're not rightly dividing this. And so, yeah, it's kind of a lose-lose. We had to do that. But we're not doing that this time. We're just going to get straight into it. Mm -hmm. So I guess we'll start with uh, <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians 1. Mm -hmm. In 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 6, we read, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and give to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Wait, wait, stop right there. So what I love about this passage is it's not a matter of interpretation. You just have to simply read it. So it says, You will receive rest when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Um, the following verse makes it even clearer. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the rest comes when he's revealed with his mighty angels, not just at the church. We know that from verse 8 because he's also taking vengeance on those who do not know God. And those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we can read 9, I guess. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe. So when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe. is the same time that he comes in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God. Verse 8. So when he comes in that day to be admired among all those who believe, they're seeing him. Verse 7, he is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. The church has seen him. This is talking about the church. And it's then, that is the time that he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. We, we, we have no reason to separate these two events and turn them into two separate events. Um, verses 6 to 10 make it very clear that when he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, that is the time that he comes, verse 10, in that day to be glorified in his saints and, and to be admired among all those who believe. We, we, this is not... Unfortunately, a lot of people who, who do believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, they'll, they'll try to explain away this verse. They'll try to find a way to refute this verse. But you're just refuting scripture. You're not refu I mean, you're not refuting the idea that the, that the rapture is not a pre-tribulation rapture. You're refuting the plain reading of the passage. We don't refute that Jesus had 12 disciples. We don't try to refute that, you know, he rose on the third day. So the fact that people do that, well, we'll have to do that because it doesn't fit their system. Just abandon the system. Let scripture speak. It's speaking very clearly, very plainly. Um, it doesn't take a great exegete to understand this. Should we read the next chapter? Well, we can just leave it at that. We can, you want to read the next, the next chapter? chapter quickly, okay, yeah. Then, so... 2 Thessalonians 2, starting from verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, 
We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Well, I'll just stop you right there. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So here we read very clearly, everyone's being deceived, but let no one deceive you. The falling away needs to happen first. Now in the Greek, the word is apostasia. So the apostasy, um, dispensational teachers, well, sorry, pre-tribbers, I should narrow it down. Uh, they, they will teach that falling away actually means a spatial departure, which that's not what it means at all. Check any lexicon, check the Septuagint, check the Greek New Testament. It's not used in that way ever. It's just basically redefining words to fit their system. But, you know, let's just, for argument's sake, accept that interpretation. So, let no one deceive you by any means for that day. The gathering of the church, as we saw in verse 1, will not come unless the gathering comes first. That doesn't make any sense. I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, with pre they they'll often boast about how they use a, that their method is a literal interpretation of Scripture. But it's only literal when it fits their system. I mean, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, we read about the last trumpet. Is it the last trumpet or not? I mean, if we're reading it literally, it's the last trumpet. But in Matthew 24, we have a trumpet. Um, I mean, there's obviously, obviously other examples we can use, but mm -hmm. I guess I'll just leave it at that. Um, Jesus says to the Christians at that time period in Revelation 2.10, he says, Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. In Revelation 2.26, it says, To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. So over and over, we're finding out that the book of Revelation is a book about victory. It's about endurance. But all of those things happen as people endure persecution. They endure tribulation. They endure the wrath of Satan. Now, I think it's super important to distinguish between the wrath of Satan versus the wrath of God, because every tribulation position that I've heard of all agree that the Bible does say that basically Christians are not appointed to God's wrath. But we can't count the entire seven year period as God's wrath because that would go against what Revelation chapter 6 says. In the fifth seal, basically you have all of these martyrs that are under the altar that have been massacred and they are begging God for him to pour out his wrath so that they can have justice for their debts. And in that part of the Bible, they hear a voice basically saying, hang tight, you know, just hold on. There's not the full number of martyrs. They haven't happened yet. And so it's kind of interesting looking back at the passage that kind of talks about some people being destined to go to prison, to fall by the sword, all of these different things. God essentially knows what the fate of every single one of his Christians are. He knows who they are and he is counting the every hair on their head and he is not, he's not, he's not preventing them from being martyred. In fact, they're encouraged that, you know, even if the devil puts them in prison and kills them and persecutes them, that they need to hold fast, hold fast to the faith and not give up so that they can keep their crown. And I could go on and on about a lot of the different passages throughout the New Testament that has the same theme of not denying the name of Jesus, of, you know, basically being willing to take up our cross. From, and they will say, I got it from this teaching, from this book, from this Bible school, from this TV teaching televangelist. But they're not going to say, I got it reading my Bible at home. No one ever discovers the pre-tribulation rapture teaching sitting at home alone. You have to be taught this message, which is a very important point. No one, no one just stumbles into a pre-tribulation conviction unless you're taught the teaching first. And here's why I think this is significant. Much of the church today is already living in tribulation. They're not living in the great tribulation that will precede the Lord's return, but they're living in tribulation. And we in the West are not. We're about to be, but we're not right now. 
And that's why believers in Iran and Syria and difficult places around the Middle East, the Muslim world, the Buddhist world, the Hindu world, who are dealing with persecution, who are dealing with incredible challenges, they're not preparing for escape from trouble because they live in trouble all day long. It's the air that they breathe. And so they are prepared for future tribulation because they're living in present tribulation, which is a very important reality for us to grapple with is this. The pre-trib rapture is conducive to Western culture. It's not conducive to a culture that's enduring persecution. I'm going to read a quote from you, a quote to you from someone that I have great respect for. And if you know her name, you have great respect for her too. Her name is Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom, you may know this name from what they did for the Jewish people, her and her family did for the Jewish people during the Holocaust. Amazing family, amazing woman. This is what she wrote in 1974. She survives the Holocaust and she writes this in 1974. Hear these words from a woman who endured more than you and I can possibly imagine. I think she has a right to speak. She says this, there are some among us teaching that there will be no tribulation, that the Christians will be able to escape all of this. These are the false teachers that Jesus was warning us to expect in the latter days. Most of them have little knowledge of what is already going on across the world. I have been in countries where the saints are already suffering terrible persecution. In China, the Christians were told by American Bible teachers Quote, don't worry, before the tribulation comes, you will be raptured. Then came a terrible persecution. Millions of Christians were tortured to death. Later, I heard a bishop from China say sadly, quote, we have failed. We should have made the people strong for persecution rather than telling them Jesus would come first. Tell the people how to be strong in times of persecution, how to stand when the tribulation comes, to stand and to not faint. Corey Ten Boom.